Every time we dive into this project, something new and amazing pops out, and today is no exception. So now, by popular demand, MIDI on the Mister, five ways. As its name implies, the Musical Instrument Digital Interface is a protocol and connection standard for linking instruments, computers, and audio devices together. The specification traces its roots all the way back to 1981, so it's a natural fit with our MISTER's retro computer course. A standard MIDI link can carry 16 channels of information, with each being able to control a separate device. Data is transmitted serially at a rate of 31 and a quarter kilobits per second. In addition to musical data, the format can be used to transmit control information to and from attached devices. This has allowed manufacturers to implement their own proprietary message types to extend the MIDI protocol well beyond its original design, giving it surprising longevity in a rapidly changing digital world. So now, let's take a quick look at two of the MIDI devices we'll be using with the MISTER today. The Roland Multitomber Sound Module, or MT32, is a MIDI synthesizer that was first released in 1987 for a price of $695, US dollars, or $1,600 in today's currency. These types of devices were used by musicians to generate the sound of many different instruments when connected to a MIDI keyboard or computer, and were most commonly used for performance and recording purposes. The MT32, however, found a different niche as a high-end music device for personal computers. Distributed exclusively in the US by Sierra Online, many of their software titles supported the device, as we'll see later on. The Roland Sound Canvas was released four years later in 1991 with a retail price just short of $800. This device made use of the new General MIDI specification, which provided a standard mapping of instrument banks, making music data much more portable between devices. The SC55 featured over 300 instruments, 24 voice polyphony, and pseudo MT32 compatibility. Both the MT32 and the later SC55 were used by composers to create the original music tracks for many PC games, so while an AdLib or Sound Blaster card may have been the only affordable option for the majority of us and represented a huge step up from the lowly PC speaker, these high-end devices would allow you to hear the music as it was originally scored. Right, so these devices were out of reach for most gamers of the day, especially if, like me, they were only teenagers at the time. Here in the present day, the price of real hardware has been steadily climbing as retro continues to gain steam. Thankfully, there's emulation. And that brings us to Munt, a multi-platform software synthesizer for emulating pre-General MIDI devices such as the MT32 and others. The software has been around since 2004 and is very mature in its present form, providing extremely faithful sound reproduction, as we'll see shortly. To complete our experience, we'll also want to emulate the sound canvas, and that can be accomplished with FluidSynth. Like Munt, FluidSynth runs on many different platforms, but differs in that it uses sound fonts to reproduce audio. The sound font format first appeared on the Sound Blaster AWE32 and defines collections of samples with all the requisite parameters needed to reproduce a given sound. By providing a sound font of the SC55 to FluidSynth, we should be able to get a decent reproduction. Now that we have the means to emulate both the MT32 and SC55, we'll need a way to ship the MIDI data around. That's where MIDI Link comes in. This software essentially creates a virtual MIDI cable that allows us to connect our emulated devices together, either locally or across a network connection. MIDI Link is a snap to add to any existing MISTER installation, so let's see how that works now. First is a solution that requires no additional hardware or software, just the MISTER itself. In this example, we're going to use Munt, FluidSynth, and MIDI Link right on the MISTER's ARM CPU, operating in parallel with the system core on the FPGA. To get started, you'll need a working MISTER and have run the update script at least once. Navigate to your scripts folder and select the MIDI Link updater. The script will automatically install all the necessary software, as well as download the MT32 ROM and SC55 sound font to your SD card automatically. Once it's done, the system will reboot and we'll be ready to try it out. The next thing we need to do is boot up the 486 core and configure the MIDI connection. In the core's settings, locate the UART mode and change the connection to MIDI. 
Selecting MIDI Link Local will connect the core to the Linux process running on the ARM CPU. We can also choose between MUNT and FluidSynth here, depending on what our game supports. Using sound fonts, FluidSynth is able to pull off a pretty faithful reproduction of the SC55 right on the mister, and it requires no additional wiring, hardware, or costs, as everything is built right in. Next, let's change the synth to Munt and try a game that supports MT32 music. What you're hearing is a result of the Mr. CPU not being fast enough to emulate the MT32's dedicated hardware that it uses for linear arithmetic synthesis. I picked this game as an extreme example, but it's worth noting that not all titles have such drastic issues. Okay, that's pretty neat, but it can be a little hit or miss. The DE10 Nano's dual-core ARM CPU just isn't fast enough for some use cases. But I'll give you one guess what is. The second MIDI option was demonstrated recently in episode 33, which became the inspiration for this video. The Raspberry Pi has a much faster quad-core ARM CPU than the Mister, so it shouldn't suffer from the same problems we just witnessed. At only $35, it's very affordable, and with this solution, you don't need any special add-ons. We'll take a quick look at this option, but keep in mind that this isn't a comprehensive guide on how to set it up. You can start with any existing Raspberry Pi OS-based installation you already have, including RetroPie, which is what I'm using here. What I've done is installed the ARM builds of Munt, FluidSynth, and MIDI-Link on the Pi as you can see here. I've also copied over the MT32 ROM and SC55 sound font data from the Mister, as well as created a very basic start script that kicks off a network listener and the emulator processes. Now, back on the mister, I need to drop to a shell with F9 and edit the midilink.ini file. The only change required is to alter the UDP server to reflect the IP address of the Raspberry Pi's Wi-Fi interface. Don't do what I just did and put an inline comment here. It won't work, and you'll waste a bunch of time trying to figure out what went wrong. That done, we can hit F12 to return to the Mister's menu and boot up the 486 core once again. In the core's menu, we'll go back into the UART settings. This time, instead of local, we'll configure MIDI link to use UDP. This will tell it to stream all of the MIDI data coming from the 486 core over the network to the IP address we specified in the config file a moment ago.
How cool is that? No performance issues whatsoever, and it sounds great. The only drawbacks are that the audio coming from the Pi must be mixed back in with the digital effects from the Mister, and there may be some lag due to Wi-Fi latency. Some claim the Pi's built-in audio has poor output quality, but to my untrained ear it sounded fine in this case. Which he hasn't seen since Space Quest 2. Having successfully rescued those two inmates from Andromeda, he decides a pit stop on Magnetius is in order. Moving right along, option number three is similar to what was just demonstrated. This time, instead of using a Raspberry Pi, we'll run the MIDI emulation on a PC instead. Munt and FluidSynth builds are available for Windows and Mac OS, and you'll need a few additional programs to tie everything together. Loop MIDI provides a virtual loopback cable to tie our software MIDI devices together. Once Munt is launched, we can connect it to the Loop MIDI port. UDP MIDI provides a network listener to receive data from the MISTER and binds it to the same Loop MIDI port that Munt is connected to. On the MISTER side, the setup is the same as in the last example. Just make sure your PC's IP address is entered into the midilink.ini file. This option is a good choice if you don't have a spare Raspberry Pi kicking around or just want to experiment a bit. A modern PC will have no performance issues emulating the MT32, but it does require your mister to be close by. You'll also run into the same issue where the music and game sounds need to be mixed back together as with the previous option. So the Raspberry Pi is an excellent option for your MT32 or SC55 emulation needs, but now there's a way to make the experience even better. The fourth option we'll look at today is the MT32 Pi. This project is a bare metal kernel for your Raspberry Pi that allows it to boot nearly instantly and provides both Munt and FluidSynth support. It also implements many slick new features that I'll demonstrate shortly. In addition to the software itself, a hat is also available that enables many of the new capabilities built into the Mister and MT32 Pi. The hat features an OLED display that is able to mimic the MT32 and SC55 screens. It also features buttons to control the device and a built-in digital to analog converter that provides higher sound quality than the Pi's built-in audio jack. The hat is compatible with the Pi 3 and above, so we'll be testing it with this 3B Plus today. Once installed, the hat allows the Raspberry Pi to connect to the Mister without the need for separate power, audio, or MIDI cabling, making it one of the most convenient options. On the Mister's I.O. board, what looks like a USB 3 port is what's called the user port that provides serial I.O. communication for custom solutions such as this one. When connected to the user port, the Raspberry Pi can be fully powered from the Mister. MIDI data is transmitted to the Pi directly, offering the lowest latency solution available. Audio generated by the MT32 Pi's DAC is transmitted back to the Mister where it's mixed in with the FPGA core's audio. Further, a control channel is provided that allows the Mister's on-screen menus to control the MT32 Pi settings and vice versa. Setting up the MT32 Pi is a snap. Start with a FAT32 formatted SD card. Download and unzip the MT32 Pi software onto the card. Next, place the MT32 ROM files in the appropriate directory. They're still protected by copyright, so they're not part of the distribution. The software ships with a general MIDI sound font by default, but you can place the SC55 sound font here as well, along with any others you want to use. Last, depending on your hardware setup, you may need to edit the config file. 
In it, you can specify custom MUNT and fluid synth settings. Since we're using the MT32Pi hat, we can choose the I2S DAC instead of the headphone jack. You can also configure the type and size of the OLED screen that your device has. In our case, the vendor provided a fully functional config file on their website that can just be dropped into place. With our SD card configured and everything else taken care of with this single cable, it's time to flip the power switch and see how long this thing takes to boot. Yeah, I think that'll work. Now, when the mister detects that the MT32Pi is connected, a new submenu will appear in the on-screen display. Here, you can enable or disable the device and select which synth and sound font you want to use. Changes made in the menu are sent via the I2C bus and are immediately reflected on the OLED display. Of course, the same is true in reverse. On the MT32Pi, the button on the left is used to switch between MUNT and Fluid Synth modes. The button on the right switches between available sound font banks when Fluid Synth is in use. I'm thirsty. I don't think you should drink that. It looks bad for you. Nonsense. It makes me feel great, smarter, more aggressive. I feel like I could. Like I could. <laughs> Like I could. Take on the world. the Lincoln Tunnel, Sam. Looks to me like a marginally volatile hostage situation, Max. Ooh, does this mean we get to kick some puffy white mad scientist butt? Can't think of a reason not to. You'll be of no use, freelance police. With the flip of a lever, my ungrateful lunch date will be reduced to a half cup of disoriented atomic matter. I knew he wasn't a real doctor. Uh, shall I confront, subdue, and pummel the suspected perpetrator, Sam? Sick him up, little buddy. Ooh. Ow. Hey, nice one. Yikes! Pleasantly understated credit sequence. I enjoyed the cheesy retro ambiance. What the hell are you talking about, Max? Sam, either termites are burrowing through my skull, or one of us is ticking. Oops. Oh, yeah. Max, where are you?
Where should I put this so it doesn't hurt anyone we know or care about? Out the window, Sam. There's nothing but strangers out there. Up till now, we've only looked at the 486 core, but it isn't the only one on the Mister that can use these MIDI interfaces. The Atari ST had MIDI ports integrated into the original hardware, so it only makes sense that it would work here as well. As with the 486 core, no additional setup is required to use the MT32 Pi, but each piece of software has its own requirements, such as King's Quest 4 demonstrated here. Like the Atari, the Amiga also has a limited number of game titles that support external MIDI devices, just over around a dozen each. The PC, on the other hand, had between 600 and 900 supported titles. A number of Japanese systems, including the PC-98 and X68000, also made extensive use of the MT32 and SC55. Also like the Atari, each piece of software has its own unique requirements. For the Sierra game, there's a configuration tool, but it works best when playing the game from a floppy disk. In this example, I'm using WHD load, so editing the config file by hand is another option that may be easier in some cases. And now we've arrived at the fifth and final option we'll look at today. This little guy right here gives the Mister a proper MIDI interface to which we can attach any physical hardware we want. I'd like to give a big thanks to Simon Verischockner for loaning us his real deal MT32 and SC55 hardware for this episode. This interface is simply called the Mister MIDI version 1.2 and it was created and sold by Legacy Pixels. For those of you who want the most authentic MIDI experience using real hardware, this is your answer. While emulators are convenient, they don't give you access to all of the controls and settings the real devices have, nor can they be used for both input and output across a wide range of devices. Setup is a snap. Like the MT32 Pi, the device connects to and is powered by the user port on the Mister's I.O. board. It offers real MIDI input and output DIN connectors, to which I'll attach the MT32, as demonstrated here. One downside to using real hardware is that the left and right audio output channels are separate quarter-inch jacks, so you need a mixer 
preferably period correct like this one, to connect the MIDI synth and the Mr. I.O. board to your output device. It does result in a bit of a rat's nest of wires, but that's just part of the high-end audio experience, right? I alluded to this earlier, but with this solution, you're not limited to just MIDI output for games. You can attach any type of MIDI device you want, including real instruments as an input source. This would allow you to use the MISTER for composing music using vintage sequencers like Cubase, for example. Back in our MISTER core, there's no special setup required at all. Just ensure that the UART mode is set to none, and MIDI commands will automatically be sent to the attached devices via the user port. All that's left now is a little side-by-side -side comparison using the authentic hardware and the MT32 Pi. So there we have it, five ways to use MIDI on the MISTER. From a zero cost option to authentic hardware, there's something here for everyone. In my opinion, the MT32 Pi nails the perfect balance of features, convenience, and price. It's an awesome addition to an already amazing project. Thanks again to Simon for generously loaning us his Roland gear to play around with. I hope you learned something new, I certainly did. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits.